Well, there's an apocryphal story that someone asked John what it was like to be chairman, and John said, I was born to be a chairman. Welcome, please, Dr. John Nigeria. He was huge, gentle, had soft hands, deep voice, and was naturally charismatic. At the age of 12, you were in a life-threatening situation, and that changed your life. It, it actually did. At 12 years old, I had appendicitis, and the appendix ruptured, and this was back in early 1940. And the mortality rate was around 80% for people with ruptured appendix in those days. And at that time, I was in the hospital for about six weeks. Obviously, I made it. But the people I respected the most were the doctors and the nurses that took care of me. And I said, if I get out of here, this is what I want to do. And uh, I did. John was easy to get along with, remembered everybody's name, was considerate in almost every way, thoughtful. And he's an excellent surgeon, and he loved his patients, and they learned to love him. John Nigerian was bigger than life. John Nigerian was full of life. He loved life, and he grabbed and lived his life. His family must be so proud. Dr. Nigerian said one of his most favorite things in the world was to go to a football game in the autumn and eat apples. You know, he thought that was the best. He was playing football and going to medical school at the same time, juggling those two things. And he was able to play in the Rose Bowl when he was a medical student. I mean, he was an all-American tackle at the University of California during his college days. He was even drafted by the Chicago Bears, but he was in the middle of medical school and declined that. Somewhat reluctantly, I imagine, but his heart was so in the direction of his education. In 1967, when he came here, he was already a national figure in kidney transplant services. He had pioneered the one at University of California, San Francisco. So when he came to Minnesota, that was one of his first priorities to gather the team that could make this also a mecca for transplants. One of his first recruits was Dr. Richard Simmons. He was kind of a quarterback and a coach and a football player all at once. And he appreciated the teamwork that was necessary to do the job. No one was a bigger cheerleader for his team members than John Nigerian was. He was a, a natural leader, so much so that he didn't take his own time in developing the concept of him as the leader. It just naturally flowed out of him. His reliance and empowering the people around him was maybe the most important part of his leadership. Uh, he engendered incredible loyalty because he did that. Even when I came here and the people that he had put together here in terms of transplant was just phenomenal. I mean, I was just one of uh, one of several uh, young surgeons on his team. He was a patient's first surgeon scientist. His patients loved him. Just listening to how he told patients about what was going on with them, you would find yourself so engaged in the story that he was telling the patient and how he encouraged the patient to kind of get on board with getting well, uh, that it was real, really inspiring for me. He cared about them, he cried with them, he explained procedures. He was a touchy-feely doctor, and patients needed those hugs. They needed that hand. They adored him, and they should have. He not only saved their lives, but he did it with such empathy. John Nigerian was very much interested in expanding the availability of transplantation to patient groups that had been excluded from consideration early on. The national attention on the Jamie Fisk case was phenomenal. Part of that was Charlie Fisk's appeal to the Pediatric Society and the singing of Please Don't Take My Sunshine Away. It got media attention, and the University of Minnesota was the only place that Charlie and Marilyn Fisk felt could help their daughter. That was an incredible time uh, for our program because we knew that no one had ever transplanted a child that age with a successful liver. If you mention Jamie Fix, I can't help but smile. The most joy in my life with Jamie was just before Christmas was when we completed the transplantation and were able to discharge her for Christmas and hear this little 
pumpkin. She looked like a little pumpkin. Now it changed to a just an absolutely delightful little lady, and she became the basis of all of our work in transplantation from there on. Thank you to Dr. Nigerian and his entire staff for, for that gift of life. Thank you. John's major contribution in his life, the reason he and a number of us who worked with him received the Medawar Prize was we used anti-lymphocyte globulin. The lymphocytes were the cells in the body which led to the rejection of foreign grafts and other invading agents. But there was a complaint by the pharmaceutical companies complaining that the Nigerian didn't have to uh, fill out all the forms that the drug companies needed to do. And when this complaint came through, they investigated the manufacturing system and uh, accused John criminally of illegal selling of this material. Dr. Nigerian's handling of that was inspirational to a lot of us. He maintained and equanimity and optimism throughout that process. He in no way acted in a way that would be disruptive the way others were acting to be disruptive. I, I mean, it was, you know, it was a, a truly generous and remarkable response by him. Before the defense could present their material, the judge declared it dismissed. And the judge, if you go back and look at the record, had a long statement to the, uh, to the prosecuting attorney about how unnecessary this was, how ridiculous this was. Literally used the term piling on, a good football term, about how they'd added charges that were unnecessary and, and, and ridiculous. From the beginning, I, uh, everybody said I was too optimistic. And the reason I was optimistic is for a variety of, one, I was not guilty of anything. And I knew that, and I didn't think the evidence would ever show differently. I thought if I was sitting on the bench, I would have asked the same question. What, what, what do they want? Uh, we ran a program. We found something that worked. It saved lives. 20 to 30 percent of people were alive that weren't before. After giving them 28 years and trying to make the university what it is, a great place. It still is and will always be. I hope I contributed to that. But when the time came, my, the price of all that was that I had to take the fall. Dr. Nigerian forgave all those people who kind of shunned him and who didn't support him and went on with his life. Maybe that says as much about him as any of the parts of his life that we know. One of the important things is that he taught us all was that you could be a surgeon and a leader and a gentleman at the same time. Dr. Nigerian was a real humanitarian. He wanted to, to do good for the world. He told me one of the last times I saw him that he doesn't regret anything. It's all part of life. And he did his best. He knows he did his best. And what an amazing life he had. You have two debts that you owe. One to the patient to make him well or her well. And the second is to pass the word along to others on how to do it. He really standardized, protocolized uh, transplantation so that it became routine for people. He started the first formal transplant fellowship and people have gone from this program to lead uh, you know, transplant programs literally all over the world. You know they always say to surround yourself with people whose eyes light up when they see you coming. And Dr. Nigerian did that. There was a lot of people who loved him. You all have heard the expression of Sir Isaac Newton when he spoke of standing on the shoulders of giants, and I think that's what we're here to celebrate. Dr. Nigerian is truly a giant in the field of surgery. His skill and persistence have benefited countless patients and their families, and his stature and commitment have built upon the legacy of the University of Minnesota. In fact, I think it's created much of the legacy that we share here at the University of Minnesota. Very thankfully uh, to him uh, because he saves uh, my life, so 
I, I think it's best. Do you remember the first time that you did a transplant successfully and the feeling you had at that time? The feeling was one of awe. Uh, really, you're doing the Lord's work, but to have an opportunity to do it is unbelievable. To give life. 